Look, I mean, we're in the national championship game, so there's obviously a ton of motivation just to go out and to play well. Um, it's hard to get here. You know, it's a difficult uh, road for, for any college football team, just making it through the season. There's so many things that have to happen for you to be have a chance to play for a national championship. I mean, just, you know, from from obviously staying healthy to, to figuring out ways to win games when you don't play your best, that's going to happen every year. You know, there's going to be two or three games that you have to go out and, and figure out how to win because there's going to be some things that, you know, some situations where the ball didn't bounce your way, um, you know, just you're kind of beat up, you're a little tired, you catch a bad matchup. You know, we had a three game, um, three out of four games during the kind of stretch run for us were on the road. We had to go to West Virginia, Texas, and, and Baylor in a, in a four week span. And we hadn't won at West Virginia in, in a really long time. And so, um, you know, there was a bunch of challenges and a lot of things that have to happen, but our guys have have embraced the idea that you have to play well every week. And to me, that's what makes college football so unique and so different is, you know, you can't go out there and lay an egg. You really can't afford to do that. you got to play hard every game. you got to play for 60 minutes every game, no matter what the, the outcome is. And, you know, you go back and you look at our game against Kansas State. We lose to Kansas State in the Big 12 championship game, and we got down. Uh, we were down 11 points in the fourth quarter, and, if our guys don't continue to play and get that game into overtime, then we may not make the, you know, the, the college football playoff. And so, you just have to play hard. You got to keep your head down. You got to keep grinding. You got to do the little things right uh, to give yourself a chance to play well every week. And so, we come into this game with a lot of motivation. Obviously, it's been a long season. Um, you know, I think we've exceeded expectations at least externally. Uh, and so, anytime you do that, there's always a little bit of extra motivation. Yeah, so, uh, so Kendry Miller's status. So he, uh, day before yesterday, uh, did a little bit of work. You know, it's one of those deals where we wanted to give him some time to rest up and recover and see where he was at. Um, did a bunch, of, a bunch of work, probably a little bit more than we thought he was going to be able to do. Uh, woke up yesterday a little sore. Um, I think feels better today. So we'll continue to try to, to see where he's at. I think, you know, to me in the next 24 hours is when obviously we'll have to make a determination and have a pretty good idea on what he's going to be able to do going in the game Saturday. We're still, or, or Monday rather, we're still optimistic, um, you know, that he's going to be able to, to, to play. And so we'll see how he feels today. Uh, I think today is going to be important um, and see, you know, just kind of see where he's at, see how he feels. And the biggest thing obviously is, is he's confident in it, feels good about it. And, and, you know, we want him to be very effective. We just don't want to, we don't put him out there and give him, give him an opportunity to get more injured. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you know when you play Georgia, you've got to be able to run the football. I think that's the 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 thing that you have to be able to do at least some is uh, is run it. Um, if not, you know, you're playing right into their hands. You know, they can really pressure you, can heat you up. Um, you know, it allows those defensive linemen to really play free. And so I think it's always the case when you play somebody, you're going to be much more effective when you can have a run threat. But in particular against a team like Georgia, it's really important to, to be able to run the ball effectively. Now, I'm not saying you need to rush for 300 yards, but you need to be able to uh, consistently run the ball. you got to stay out of third and long situations. Um, and when you can do that, then I think it puts more pressure on them. It takes some pressure off of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's funny. I didn't really know Chidera. This question is about Chidera Yuse Deribe, who used to um, coached with us at SMU and then brought him to TCU and now is at Georgia. Um, I didn't really know Chidera. Uh, Jim Levitt was our defensive coordinator when I was at SMU, and, and Chidera had had worked with Jim, and so uh, Jim obviously really highly recommended him. He had been an analyst, I believe, for, for Jim, and a player and an analyst. And uh, he was, you know, hired him at SMU, and he was really, really good. I mean, he was one of those guys that you knew early he was destined to be really good. He's a, 
got a great uh, disposition when it comes to, uh, to coaching and communicating with players. Uh, really, really effective communicator. Does a really good job of walking the fine line between, you know, having great relationships with players, but at the same time, you know, having that authoritative uh, part of, of the relationship that's important. Uh, so he's really good, really bright, got a really good future in front of him. You know, he's one of those guys I expect him to, you know, be a coordinator, head coach, and, uh, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, just I think he's on a on a really rapid rise, and I think a lot of them, and got a great family, and like I said, it's going to be a real star in, in our profession. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like you said, you kind of, uh, I think fortuitous is a good word. I think, uh, you know, it's important for the Big 12 and our credibility to have teams that, you know, that perform well and, uh, and can win. And, um, you know, you lose two of the more high-profile members of the, of, of the conference, obviously, with Texas and Oklahoma moving on. But, you know, I think that was what was so good about the Big 12 this year was you got to see from top to bottom just how good the league was. And it's probably as good a league. Uh, it's probably the best that the Big 12 has been in a long time. And the two brand-name institutions really weren't as good as they typically are. And so I think it speaks to the strength of the league, the overall strength. I think it speaks to the momentum that the Big 12 has. Uh, that two remaining teams were in the championship game with us and Kansas State. Um, you know, I think the future for the Big 12 is very bright. I think the four added institutions coming in uh, all have tremendous potential uh, and have had success, obviously, through the years. And so I think, I think the league is going to be better and continue to be better than most people give it credit for being. Um, the timing was really good. The timing was good. And like you said, you try not to worry about too much right now with the big picture stuff, but I do I do believe that it was an important year for the league, um, and I think it was important to get somebody into the college football playoff because it's been a while since that happened, and in particular a member institution that's staying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've heard it. I've heard it some from some folks through the years. I mean, <coughs> excuse me. The good thing is, um, the good thing is, as you said, I mean, there's been a pretty good 20-year run, uh, really, with a lot of a lot of consistency. You look from you know 2010 to 2020, there was a lot of years there where TCU was in the top 10 and spent a lot of time really in the top five. Uh, and I think a lot of people didn't really recognize that. And look, I was pretty knee deep in college football and I'm not sure that I understood uh, the consistent success that TCU had. You know, I was doing my own thing and I was working and for whatever reason, it didn't seem like TCU might've been the biggest story in college football, but they probably deserved to be just because the, the team was really strong, really consistent, won a lot of big games, you know, had some opportunities like we did against Michigan to really you know, put their mark on, on college football and won most of those games. You know, you look at some of the big bowl wins, obviously the Rose Bowl. Um, you know, you look at some of those some of those wins, and those were really good TCU teams. And so there has been a good history, but when you do talk to some of the, the older fans and, and in particular players that played, you know, they, they there were some lean years um, and a lot of lean years. And I think that there was a lot of trying to figure out their – their way in college football and how important was college football to, to the TCU community and you know and people ask me all the time when you're trying to, to rebuild a program you know what comes first kind of the chicken or the egg is there is the investment come first and then the success comes later or success first and investment you know and I, I think at TCU fortunately for them it seemed to, to happen at the same time you know they had a really good coach and coach Patterson they had a really good AD and Chris Del Conte and, uh, and they were able to, to make some big moves in a small amount of time because of the, 
you know, a, a real strong commitment from the top down. Um, and so we were, we were fortunate enough to, you know, to reap the benefits of that. Okay. Yeah. You know, Chris, it's interesting. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's funny, we have, uh, you, you know, you hate to, you don't ever want to be critical of anybody ever, but you know, there are, there are people in our profession, just like there are in every profession, whether it's athletics or business, whatever the case may be, where, you know, people have, you know, they go to, they go to some company, some company has a lot of success, some company loses their CEO, some company hires this guy to be their CEO, probably doesn't have the resume or the success to to be the CEO, but he falls into a really good situation and continues to have a lot of success with the company. That happens a lot in our profession. And I think what happens is when that when, when that occurs, you know, everybody gets labeled as this or that. And you know, there's a lot of different ways to 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 reach the top of the the profession in our profession. Um, some guys you know, have a have a easier road than others, and some people have to, you know, to have some jobs at institutions maybe that haven't historically won. And as you work your way up, you know, your job's to fix those. And sometimes they're not easy to fix, and sometimes they take longer to fix than you want them to. And sometimes there's a reason those places haven't had success in a long time. And so it's it's. Um, you know, and you learn from everything. I mean, you really do. I, the, I, my time at Cal was difficult. I'm very, very glad I went through it because it makes me appreciate this so much more. You know what I mean? Had I um, been places that were historically successful and kind of fallen into some, some situations that were, quote, easier, um, you know, I might have a better record. Uh, but but I wouldn't have the you know I wouldn't have the the opportunity to understand how good I've got it if that makes sense and, I, and that's not taking a shot at anybody I mean it's really not it's just it just makes you appreciate when something's really good and it makes you take a lot of care for that and it makes you um, understand it and so. Anyway, it's it's. I learned a lot from that experience. I learned a lot from at Louisiana Tech. I learned a lot um, at Cal. Learned a lot at, at SMU. Learned a lot in 2017 when I was working with Coach Patterson. Yeah, you, know, you just try to make sure that every situation you take something from it and you apply it to your situation and you try to come out on the better on the other end better than you were before. Um, and that was. Uh, I loved living in the Bay Area. It was a really cool place for me. I had an, always had an itch to, to live in California. You know, I grew up in West Texas, and you know, there's a significant difference between Lubbock and Berkeley. Um, and so, I appreciated that difference. You know what I mean? And just in terms of everything, culture, way of thinking, um, approach, temperature, weather, scenery. I mean, to me, it was just I liked. I wanted to experience different things in my life. Uh, that's just something that's always been really important to me, and it was a, it was a challenging time. Um, I truly believe, I still believe this. If Sandy Barber was the AD there, I think I'd still be at Cal, and we would have been very successful. Um, but it's not the way it worked, and it wasn't the uh, it wasn't uh, the way you know that won the plans, and and so you know had to go to Plan B, which was kind of start over, reinvent myself, and and pray for another opportunity and SMU gave me that opportunity and I'll be forever grateful for that. Um, and, you know, I think that was the, the hardest thing when, for, for me when we sat down and, and we said, okay, is, is do we want to make this move from SMU to TCU? You know it's going to be hard. I'm incredibly indebted to, to SMU for believing in me and giving me this opportunity. But at the end of the day, you know, you want to have a chance to, to play for a national championship. And, that's when I sat down and talked to Kate about about this opportunity. That's what we kept coming back to. I just said, you know what? I truly believe we can win a national championship at TCU. Um, it's going to take some time. You know, we thought uh, it was going to be 
a little bit more of a journey maybe than it's ended up being, and at least we're having a chance to play for it sooner than I expected. But I certainly believed it could be done. Um, and again, that's just from a resource commitment uh, standpoint. And so, you know, here we are. And uh, it's been a heck of a ride, and we're looking forward to, to seeing if we get it done on Monday. It was a long answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. About the what stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I haven't not really. I mean, that, that's been, I think, and you and I have talked about this before, but I think that's probably been part of the reason that we've been able to get to where we are is is we we just kind of kept blinders on, you know what I mean? And I think that, you know, I'm a, I'm a football historian, you know, like most coaches are. I just have a tremendous respect for the game and the people that came before us and, and the teams and the players and, and all of it. Um, but I do think that it's been really freeing for me personally and I think for our players that we just – you know, we just kind of keep showing up and talking about trying to get better on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think it it keeps us from getting overwhelmed. It really does. And, again, when you love the game like I do and you appreciate the game like I do and you were brought up in the game like I was, um, you know, you can get overwhelmed pretty quickly, you know, because you start just looking at all the things and all the history, and, and I think that's happened to me in the past. You know, we've been in good situations before, really at La Tech and Cal and, SMU where we got off to really good starts and probably you know got a little bit overwhelmed by certain things and so that was my my goal this year was not to let that happen and it starts with me and the filters to the rest of the the staff and the players from there and so you know we've been really relaxed this year we've been really confident I really truly believe in our players uh, I know that the guys are prepared I really believe in our assistant coaches and our support staff, our strength and conditioning staff. And when all when you have alignment like we do, it gives you great um, great comfort. You know, you lay your head down at night every night, saying, "You know what? This is in a good place." And uh, and we've been able to do it pretty quickly to get there, pretty quickly. Um, and sometimes you never get there. You know, just in terms of of all the pieces that have to align for you to be have a chance to be successful. And so that's what's been so good this year is, you know, we feel like all the pieces are here and it's our job to put them together. And, and uh, But it has truly been a one-day-at-a-time approach. And I think it's been a big part of the reason for our success. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I, I don't know, I think in some ways it's a little bit like the NCAA tournament, the basketball tournament, where, you know, you're going to let more people in, which I believe, I believe in inclusion. I think there's more teams that need to be included. I think they're, you know, again, that was one of the things that, that drove me crazy about being in a non-Power 5 institution was I just never felt like you had access. Now, Cincinnati got it last year, but I really just looking at that, you felt like everything had to fall into place for that to happen. Um, the one thing I do believe, though, is as you get more teams in, there's, you can have a conversation either way that, you know, the traditional powers have to win more games, but then there's maybe an easier path for them to do that because the other teams aren't going to have as much depth. The other team is going to be a little bit more beat up. The other teams may have played more close games. All these factors that go into how healthy is a, is a non-traditional team, how much depth does a non-traditional team have, can they survive the extra two games that they're going to have to play to, to keep advancing. So, you know, I think you can make an argument either way where some of the traditional powers will benefit from the 12-team playoff, and you can also make the argument that you know, it's going to cloud things up a little bit. So I, I, I see it both ways. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. When you look at the NCAA basketball tournament, you know, you always end up with one team right on the fringe. 
of getting in, whether it's the final four or the, or the, or the final eight. Um, so, you know, I, I think you'll see that, but I do, I do wonder the impact it's going to have on, again, the traditional teams because they're going to be the ones that are, you know, more battle-tested, have more depth, maybe have had opportunities to rest their starters more, all those things that, that add up and matter at the end of the year. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah. About team, sure, sure. <coughs> well, I think I think number one, I think that speaks to just the the true team concept that does really exist. I think within a lot of football teams, and I do think that football teams are different. Um, you know, when you when you line up a football team, there's so many different kinds of people there. You know, you've got big people and small people and slow people and fast people and white people and black people and you know, just you have all these people from different backgrounds, different ways of thinking. Um, it truly is to me the most diverse you know, kind of community that exists really in anywhere in the world in these days. When the great thing about it, nobody cares who anybody's dad is or whether you're rich or poor or whatever the case may be, nobody cares. It's all about how can you help the team and what can you do for the team. And so when someone like DeMar gets injured, you know, you, you find out how quickly and how much everybody else is invested in him. Uh, in, in the team idea and, and then when he makes a miraculous recovery and the first thing he does is ask about his teammates and not himself, again it just shows the true humility of, of obviously his character but also too the, the real team thinking that, that exists and I, I think that's what makes coaching football so much fun is we, ha we get to be around these young people that are constantly told over and over again, hey, you got to get yours, you got to get yours, you got to get yours. They're told that by adults, by the way. And and everybody does, I understand that, and that's part of it. But at the same time, there's nothing like seeing people make sacrifices for each other. And uh, because it's just, it's freeing, uh, and it does um, does kind of give you hope that people are willing to, to make big picture sacrifices. Uh, and that's one of the great things about coaching. So, you know, we haven't really talked about it as a team. It's one of those things we were we were going to, and obviously there's been so much going on. We hadn't had a chance to do it. I've heard a lot of our players talking about uh, how glad they are and that he's recovering at the rate that he is. But it is um, that's a scary thing, and certainly makes you think about the big picture things in in our in our business and, and in the game of football. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have a little bit. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, you wish, you know, I mean, it's funny, you, you go back and you look at, at this ride that we've been on. Um, you know, I had a chance to speak to Coach Leach prior to his game against uh, Ole Miss, and we had, we had some really great conversations, and, you know, and, and I'm, a lot like this as well. You know, Mike is um, not always going to show his emotions and can be pretty stoic. Um, and we had some really heartfelt conversations, you know, preceding that game. And, and that gave me a lot of peace. You know, I think we both said some things to each other that we wanted to say. Certainly, I feel that way. Um, wish he was here for the ride. I mean, he would be one of those guys that he would have had an invitation to come with us and, and spend some time with us here in L.A. and um, and come to the game. I'm sure he would have declined, <laughs> but but he certainly would have had an invitation. And you know, it's 
it's sad. It really is, just because uh, you know, as you said, he never had an opportunity to, to to play for a championship like this. And what he did for college football and the game of football in general, it's really hard to measure. So you know, uh, it's sad. I think he would be proud to see you know one of his disciples you know have the kind of success that that we've had. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, I know he was because we talked about it. And obviously that was before advancing to the championship game. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's certainly been on my mind a lot. Uh, it's, you know, it's been a tough year, you know, losing Dave Nickel and then losing Mike. And, and those two guys have had a big impact on my life and, you know, just who I am as a person. And so, um, yeah, I mean, he's constantly, constantly on my mind. Yeah. 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 I think so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, certainly that's what it started out as, is a, is a way. I mean, it's basically option football. You know, the air raid is, and it's it was designed instead of handing it off to to play option football by throwing the ball, and you know, went from reading first level players to reading second level players, and it, it's kind of built on the same principles in a lot of ways. Um, execution, simplicity, fundamentals, drills, all the things that make the the option, a big equalizer, the air raid's very similar. A little different approach, but same idea. And um, yeah, so that's that's the principle of all this. And, you know, we're a little different. You know what I mean? This football team is built a little differently, maybe just because we are, uh, we are a team that runs the ball quite a bit. But again, we've taken a lot of those same principles from the air raid, applied them to the run game as well, and, and it's kind of given us this as well so we're not a traditional air raid in some in some ways but but it's certainly the the heart and soul of what we're doing offensively yeah oh for sure yeah 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 no it's been great yeah i mean look my La Tech was one of those magical places. I really love my time in Ruston, love that community. Some of my best friends are still in Ruston, guys I talk to all the time. It was just kind of a, a magical place. It was the perfect place to get started. I could make a ton of mistakes and, and um, you know, and, and it wasn't on a, a huge stage and I could kind of learn without everybody else knowing that I screwed up to the extent that I screwed up. Uh, it, it was great though. I mean, it was. You know, we had to, it was the first time really for me, I had to go, okay, this was my idea on how to build it. And you know what? That's not going to work here. Okay, so what do we do now? And so, you know, when I got the law tech job, I thought, okay, I'm going to recruit all these DFW kids and these kids from, from Houston and have got all these relationships and they're going to come to Ruston. And, you know, and all of a sudden we got there and those kids weren't interested in coming to Ruston. So we had to, to recruit a different kind of kid. We had to change our approach. Uh, when it came to player evaluations, how we were going to do it, recruiting, recruiting area, recruiting philosophy, uh, team building philosophy, all those different things, you know, we had to take about a 180 degree turn on those things uh, pretty quickly to give us a chance to be successful. And then we, our second year there, we signed 13 junior college players, you know, which in a weird sort of way was, that was today's version of going in the transfer portal. And so that was kind of our first time to do that. All right, how do you do this? How do you evaluate these guys? And so, obviously, that paid dividends for us when we went to SMU and is paying dividends for us now at, at TCU in terms of, you know, how we're going to take transfers and how can you mesh them into your program quickly and how can you still have a um, kind of a hierarchy there when you're adding these new players and, um, and how can you blend it all together. And so, you know, we had to start learning quickly then and, it's uh, like I said, it's paid dividends for us since. Uh, resilient, I think resilience is probably the best way. Uh, either resilient or confident. Um, you know, these guys just don't quit. You know, and it's it's been weird. They really believe in each other. There's a, a quiet confidence associated with this group, and there has been. They don't get too high. They don't get too low. Um, and, and really, 
when you find people or, or a team that does that, confidence is at the, at the root of that. You know, and the reason they don't get too low is because they know they're going to have an opportunity to fight back, or they believe that things are going to equalize, or they believe that um, they're going to figure out a way to get it done. And so this group just has that mentality and that belief in each other. And it's not only a belief in yourself, but it's probably more importantly a belief in the guy next to you and your teammates and really the system and the approach and everything. And believing that everything makes a difference, everything matters. We talk to our guys all the time about, you know, when we get done with this, they're going to go eat a meal. What they eat at that meal is going to matter. It's going to, it's going to have an impact on how well they play on Monday. And so those guys, you know, how much rest do they get? How, how much do they hydrate? All those things are inches, and those inches add up, and, and you know, and all that matters. Coach, are you going to have to uh, prepare Amari any more than you know, regardless of what the role would be? Would this be something <clears throat> Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, I think the big thing with him is kind of goes back to what I said earlier. You know, he's an older, he's an older kid who's got a lot of confidence, has been around a lot. Um, you know, has played in a lot of big games. You know, has a tremendous amount of, of um, experience. You know, because he's been a, he's been the one mainstay really at TCU for a long time, and and he's never really been the starter, but he's been probably as important as any player in our team through the years. Um, and your second time, your second team running back is critical in today's world, and, and he's he fills that role better than anybody. Yeah, oh yeah, it means a lot. I mean, look, when, when you get the kind of send-off we got, you know, coming out here, and it, I mean, it, it, it does, you think, you think it's important to, to Fort Worth and to DFW and to the entire community, but then, you know, when you get that many people show up at 945 on a whatever day of the week that was, um, you know, it just shows how important it is and, and how many people are truly rooting for you and invested in the program, and it's motivating. You know, it gives you that extra little push when you're a little worn out, and a little tired, a little beat up, to, to make sure you do things the right way so you can go out and play your best on Monday. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think, I think the big thing with him is just his, uh, he's just incredibly tough, you know, and, and tough means so many different things. Um, you know, he just never wavers, never gets rattled. Um, you know, he's the same whether he throws a touchdown pass or throws an interception. It's the same look. You know, it's the same reaction. Um, he's just so consistent, you know, in, in what he does. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, we talked about this earlier. When, when you haven't been through this, you have to have somebody that everybody can look to. And that person kind of has to be your rock. And I think in a weird sort of way, he's our rock uh, because... You know, on the sideline, he's the same. And, you know, again, when things are going bad, the guys come to him and, and they feed off of his energy. And I, I truly believe that that confidence and that belief and that toughness, uh, both physical and mental, has made a huge impact on our team. It just makes everybody around him better. I think that's, you know, there's a lot of really great athletes um, in different sports, but there's just very few people that, you know, raise the temperature of the room, and, and he does that. When he walks in the room, I think the temperature is raised. And um, it's like I said earlier in the year, I mean, truly, you know, when I drive to work in the morning, you know, he makes me want to be better because he's that invested in the program. He cares that much about it that when you drive in, you're going, hey, look, I want to be at my best for him because I know he's going to be at his best for us. Yep. Good morning. Yep, it is, yeah. How much is that out of your mind? You know, honestly, not much. I mean, I think the big thing is we have tried to kind of take it, a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as a one-game approach, and it's really kind of a lame cliche that people talk about all the time. But in our case, it's really true. And um, we're trying to, to, to uh, you know, there'll be plenty of time for reflection at the end of all this to, to sit down and say, you know, this was historical, this was meaningful, this was different, you know, this was maybe um, unexpected, but in a lot of ways, we just haven't done that. You know, it's really just been about 
okay, look, we, we got through that challenge. We're on to the next one. How can we prepare our very best for this challenge? And, and you know, just kind of keep our head down and, and not look up. And that's, I think it's been a, a, a good approach for us. I think it's taken a lot of pressure off our team to not think in, in terms of history or not think in terms of anything other than, hey, I'm going to show up today, I'm going to do my best and, and see where that takes us. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's funny. So when we got the job, obviously I'd been at SMU. We had played TCU. I knew that they had good players. Um, felt like maybe they hadn't played to their potential for whatever reason. Um, you know, and so it was attractive to me just because I knew there was some talent on the team. And, and so what you want to try to do when, when you have talent is you want to try to put it in the best position you can to be successful. And then you, you know, not only from a scheme standpoint, but then also, too, from a team building standpoint, try to figure out the very best ways to, you know, to build a culture. And I think that's the, that's the thing that really gets lost, I think, in so many different ways is the importance of culture. People talk about it all the time, but what does that mean? Um, and so, you know, that was our goal from the beginning is, look, let's, let's don't worry about football. Let's, let's worry about work ethic. Let's worry about doing things the right way. Let's worry about responsibility to each other. Let's worry about all these kind of intangible things, you know, kind of process-driven things. And then we'll see when we get to spring football where the football goes. We got through spring, felt like we had a pretty, pretty good team, had some huge holes in some certain areas. You know, we didn't have enough defensive linemen. And so the great thing about today's college football, we were able to go out and address some of those needs through the transfer portal. Then we got about three weeks into fall camp and we felt like, you know what, this team has a chance to be pretty good. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. You know, we didn't really talk about it, but we thought, you know, if, if we can stay healthy and some guys can improve and we can figure out who we are, then maybe we could get on a run. And, you know, and all of a sudden we look up when we're 7-0, and 8-0, and 9-0, 10-0, and, and just kind of kept it going. And, you know, I think that was – the way we, we, we approached it. Never talked about any goals as a team other than do your best every day, play hard. Um, and if that happens, then good things will happen. And that's exactly how it played out. Say it again now. Oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, um, it's been good for us. It's... Uh, it's a great teaching tool, great teaching method, uh, you know, for our players. Um, you know, I think I think it's it's been something that's been uh, like everything a, a part of our success. I mean, you sit down, and you look at all the things that have to come together. You know, there's just so much. Obviously, from a player development standpoint, from a staff development standpoint, from an opportunity to communicate to your players, um, it's it's a way to. You know, to, to gain an advantage and get a little bit of an edge, um, and so we're we're into all of that. I mean, whether it's a little bit of analytics, whether it's uh, an app, uh, you know, that allows communication between players and coaches, whether it's you know playbook stuff, whether it's um, way to integrate playbook and video. I mean, whatever the case may be, any any little advantage you can get, you know, makes a huge difference, and they all add up. And so um, that's. We've tried to, to sit down and look at everything and, and that we can to, you know, gain an inch here and there and all the inches add up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think, Kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. I mean, you know, it's like anything else. I mean, it all begins with, we, we talk about this all the time, there's, there's really three things that we believe are important to building a program. Okay, number one, it's talent acquisition. And that means, you know, good players, good coaches, good strength and conditioning people, good trainers, good everything. And so trying to, to gather up as much really talented people as you can um, the second thing, it's about developing those people. Player development, and that comes 
that comes uh, through in so many different ways. Um, and then the third thing is, is a culture. And so those are the three things that to me are really, really important. And that allows you to sustain success where it's not just a one-time thing um, when you're able to do those things. And so that's been our approach from the beginning is let's recruit as many good players as we can. Let's go hire the best coaches we can. Let's use the best technology we can. Let's do everything we can do to create a little bit of an edge. Um, and then let's continue to do it over and over and over again. And then let's make that part of what makes us successful and who we are on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's been our approach. You know, I, I typically, you know, first year, you don't end up in the, in the national championship game. So I think that was probably, honestly, never crossed my mind, you know, but I felt like we could have a good team. You know, I've been places where we've been on runs before. Um, you know, we went on a great run at Law Tech, went on a good run at Cal, went on a great run at SMU, and we weren't able to finish those runs. And so I think having been on those at different schools gave me a little bit better confidence that I, we could learn how to stay on the run and continue to have success instead of, you know, getting knocked off late like we had in the past. Um, and so that was kind of the idea, and then let's just see where it takes us. You know, big thing against against Georgia, obviously, is when you play a team like this, they're very talented. There's not a lot of weaknesses. You know, your good players have to make big plays. You know, that's just part of part of playing championship football and against very good competition. It, you know, the, the, the best players in your program have to play the best. And that's going to be true on Monday night. And then you've got to play winning football. You've got to limit big plays, create big plays, don't turn the ball over. I mean, all the kind of cliche stuff that everybody talks about, all those things matter when you play against great top competition. And so, you know, Georgia will be a big challenge for us. But again, our guys are very confident in our ability to, to, to play well. And we believe if we play well, we'll certainly have a chance to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the big thing is to try to, we, we talk about it all the time, you know, no wasted energy. You know, we, we, we don't want to waste a lot of energy on stuff that we can't control. Um, you know, our guys, our guys, if we continue to prepare well, which we have up to this point, you know, we've got to have a great walk through today, a great run through tomorrow. But they'll gain confidence from those things. That they'll know that they're prepared. And, and that allows them to, to go out and to play free. And, you know, and I think the thing with us is, don't get too high, don't get too low. If you score a touchdown, great, get back over the sideline and, and do it again. And uh, don't focus on, on that and don't waste a lot of energy in it. And same thing, if something bad happens, don't spend a lot of energy worrying about something that's already happened. And the mantra is always for us, play the next play. Um, and you know, because the next play is the most important, what happened before doesn't matter. Um, and so it's, you gotta get ready to play the next one. And, that's been our mentality all year. Um, you know, and again, you don't feel that way unless you believe in your preparation and you have confidence in your abilities and your teammates' abilities. And, and the good thing is this, this group does, and, and that's going to allow them to be pretty emotionally stable. And that's going to be really important for us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know what's funny is, you know, I think I think that there's a belief that, you know, by a lot of people, including a lot of coaches and a lot of people in our profession, that everything that's happening right now in college football is bad. And, you know, I, I'm probably in the minority in terms of my belief that, you know, anything that's good for the players, I view as a good thing. And so NIL, it makes things complicated benefits the players, I think it's a good thing. Transfer portal, complicated, hard for coaches, good for players, can be, assuming guys make good decisions, I'm for it. And so, you know, I think that's always been our thing is, you know, the game is changing daily. 
and it's my job to adapt and not only keep up, but try to to be in front of those changes and to try to um, use every opportunity to make our team better and our program better. Um, and so all those things I really truly see as positives. Uh, I think it's all about player empowerment. I'm a big believer in that. It's something that to me should have happened 30 years ago. And the, the tragedy is that we were so slow to adapt that instead of all of us collectively, the NCAA, the conferences, universities, whatever, instead of, of changing and taking care of student athletes and their welfare like we should have, you know, we basically neglected that to the point where the courts had to get involved. And so, again, I'm in a minority to view it that way, but it's, it, that's a tragedy that it had to happen that way. And then all of a sudden when the courts get involved, you have, you have chaos because they're deciding on things that obviously they don't know about from a day-to-day perspective. And so, um, you know, but we're adapting and trying to figure it out and it's big picture stuff, but you've got to, you got to continue to evolve. And that's what we try to do every day is, okay, look, this is happening. How are we going to use this to our advantage? How's it going to make us better as a program? Um, so I think that's, that's the approach that we try to take. And, you know, I do, I do love the fact that our players are more empowered and they do have better opportunities and more options. And, um, you know, I mean, it was, it's been a, a bad thing for college football that a kid goes off to college and, you know, he doesn't get to see his parents if they can't afford to come to a game. And now there's opportunities for their parents to be able to come. And, uh, you know, the CFP has done an incredible job of, of allowing, you know, our student athletes to have a, a stipend to, to use their family to travel you know, to allow their family to travel. And so a lot of our families have been able to come to our game in, in Phoenix that probably couldn't have been able to come before without that same thing here for the championship game. So all these things are, are good, and I see all the changes as positive and creates a little bit of chaos for us as coaches. But, look, that's our job to figure it out and, and deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, that was big. I mean, look, when you look at us, and this is probably something that most people don't know, but, you know, when, when we came into the, when I came into the job, um, you know, externally, I was hearing, okay, these are four players that are really important to the program that you've got to get to stay here. And three of the four left. You know what I mean? We had three of the floor, four that transferred out. And Quentin... I don't want to say, yeah, um, but, you know, there were four guys that were kind of special talents, and, you know, two of them went to Ole Miss, and um, I'm trying to remember where the other one went, but anyway, it's, you know, there were some guys that we were trying to, to hold on to, and we weren't able to do it, um, and so, well, yeah, two of the three, yeah, went to Ole Miss, and the other one, yeah. I don't really want to say, but anyway, um, so holding on to Quentin was obviously important. And I think it was important not only for his talent, but I think it was also an endorsement from him. You know what I mean? That everybody was looking for somebody to say, okay, look, I'm jumping on the train. And, and Quentin did that for us. And I think it gave our staff some credibility. You know, because when you take over in today's era of football, there's chaos, you know, you, you, there's a lot of guys are looking to leave and there's people reaching out to them and there's people talking to them and there's all these things that are happening and you're trying to get to know these guys and you're trying to, to sell them on your vision for the program. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's a complicated time. Uh, and, you know, and again, you're looking for credibility with your players. And so when Quentin says, okay, look, I, I'm, I'm going to stay here, I'm going to stick this out, I think what that does is that everybody in the program sees that. I think it calms a lot of their anxiety and, and allows them to say, okay, look, we're going to jump on board with this guy and, and see where he can take us. Yeah. 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 Well, look, we sat down and talked to Quentin's parents um, 
you know, they're both military people, unbelievable family. You can see why he's who he is. You know, and we sat down and we started, uh, you know, the conversation kind of went to NIL. And they were like, we're good. We don't, we don't need to have that conversation. That's a conversation that, um, you know, we're not that interested in. And, you know, we, we believe that if Quentin performs like he should, he'll be taken care of. And, you know, we want him to be coached and we want him to, we want you guys to care about him as a person, not just as a player. And as long as you guys do that, we're on board. And, um, and, and I think that's, I think to me, that's the great lesson in all this, you know, and I think, look, everybody wants to, to be compensated for, for their abilities and everybody wants to have an opportunity to increase their, their standing financially. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I think the guys that make the big term or the big picture decisions really are the ones that get rewarded. And the ones that say, well, I really fit in this offense or this defense. I really feel like I could be developed here. You know, those are the guys to me that have success and then have plenty of opportunities for that financial stuff down the road. And it's like, it's like coaches. I mean, you know, my dad used to tell me this all the time. Don't make decisions on your pay you know and if if I did I would still be a high school coach you know because I went for making what I thought was basically a million dollars a year I think it was thirty seven thousand dollars a year as a high school coach to making four thousand dollars a year as a college coach that's not a very good financial decision you know um, I thought it was four thousand dollars a month but that's a whole nother story when I took the job it turned out to be four thousand dollars a year um, but you know, it was the best thing for me. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't made that decision. And I think sometimes you've got to, you know, you've got to look past just the financial thing and you've got to say, okay, what's going to be the best situation for me and allow me to grow and try to reach my potential? What's up? How are you? Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think maybe a little bit. I mean, you know, look, we're the flavor of the month. I get that, you know. Um, I'd like for us to be the flavor of the decade. You know what I mean? That, to me, is a whole lot better than being the flavor of the month. Um, and that remains to be seen if we can do that. You know what I mean? I think, look, like anything else, we're a nice story. Um, and, and, and I mean that in all due respect. I mean, our players have done a remarkable job, and... And they've really earned where we are. But, um, you know, I say this all the time about our profession. You know, to me, longevity and consistency is, is what makes people great in this profession. And, um, and so, you know, obviously that remains to be seen if we can do it and, and I can do it. And, um, but, you know, there is a lot that goes into to having a successful football program. And I think that's why the traditional powers are still good. And they've always been good because it does, it takes alignment really from the top down. And I mean, it's the chicken or the egg argument, uh, but you have to have all the pieces to, to be able to sustain something for a long time. And the great thing about TCU is, as I believe we have that. Now it's up to us as coaches and players to do it, but we certainly have the opportunity to do it. And not everybody can say that. Oh, he'd get a kick out of it. I mean, he would say, you know, you're still that same guy that was at Navarro Junior College making 288 bucks a month, so don't forget it. You know what I mean? I think that's, and I think that's the, that's the, to me, that's the biggest success of this team. As the season rolled along, nobody got too big. You know what I mean? And, and players, coaches, all of us. I mean, we have really, really good coaches, and we have really good coaches that have been recognized, you know, Garrett Riley won the Frank Borles Award. You know, Garrett came to work the same day, the same as he did the day before. You know, and, and that's all of our challenge. That's, that's all of our challenge is to continue to 
you know, to continue to grind and not forget where we came from and understand that, um, you know, this is an opportunity. And I tell our players this all the time, okay, we have to approach it this way. If you're, if you're a pharmaceutical sales guy and you have a million dollar quota, okay, you go meet your million dollar quota, guess what? They congratulate you, they pat you on the back and they say, you know what, your quota is a million and a half dollars next year, congratulations. So that's what we talk to our players all the time is, okay, congratulations, here's the expectations. And, you know, can we handle them? And those are all things that, you know, remains to be seen. Uh, we've handled them this year up to this point. We need to handle them on Monday. And then moving forward, we all need to be able to, to handle them as well. So, you know, we look, I've been on both ends of this. I mean, I've, you know, I've got a lot of text messages right now from a lot of people. And then I've also been there where I didn't have one single person return my phone call for months. And so it's part of this profession. And you got to be the same person every day, you know, whether they return your phone call or, or you're scrambling to try to return theirs. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, you know, pr pretty remarkable, really. I mean, he's got about five different degrees, you know, uh, so he's really, really smart, brilliant guy, uh, very mature, very methodical. You know, it, just as a person, his work ethic and his approach, whether it's academically or his approach to football and, and playing football, you know, very disciplined, um, very mature. And, and all those things are obviously really important parts of being successful. And so the great thing about Amari is I really do believe he'll go on and play in the NFL and have a great career. Um, but when he's done playing football is when he'll really be successful because he is just a brilliant guy. And he's going to be a incredible, you know, businessman when he's done with his football career. And, um, you know, 20 years, a pretty good chance I'm going to be hitting him up for a job. You know what I'm saying? Don't forget about me uh, and see if he's got a little small role for me in some company that he's running. I think it's safe to say that you guys aren't going to be here without a change in you and this program and what you've brought, but also the fact that it's not... Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, very few coaches have meant more to their football program than Gary Patterson has to TCU. Just elevating the program and giving the credibility to the program, providing the resources that we have today that he didn't have when he first got the job. And so, you know, that to me is the way this works. I really believe this, is that we're all supposed to leave it better than we found it. You know what I mean? And I think that's – he certainly did that with TCU. He – you know, he was there with Coach Francione. Coach Francione had success, left it better than he found it. Gary left it better than he found it. And my job is to build on that. And that's hard to build on it because he had a ton of success and did it consistently for a long time. And we're in the national championship this year, which is great, but we'll see if we can have the kind of success that he had, you know, the longevity that he had. And and uh, the jury's still out on that for sure. And so, you know, that's that's what we're supposed to do. That's our job. And you know, again, we certainly wouldn't be here without him. Yeah. 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 You know, it's interesting. They're, they're, they're I don't know what, what's in the water in Mule Shoe, um, but they're both really mature, uh, thoughtful guys. Um, and to me, that's the biggest thing. I mean, look. I think Lincoln was probably more mature at 20 than I was at 30 or 40, you know, and he was just kind of, they're both old souls. They're both very calm. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, they're both kind of process driven people. It's funny. I sometimes I'll be sit down to eat a meal and I've got all this stuff stacked up on my plate and I look at Garrett's plate and it's like, it's divided, you know, like they teach you to eat your plate, you know, when you're in elementary school, like a third of it's fruits and vegetables, a third of it's grains a third of its protein and I'm just like how's this guy do this you know and that's just kind of his approach you know what I mean and that's why he's good at what he what he what he does um he's got just a methodology and a way of doing things and a, um you know a discipline and most 33 year old guys don't have that kind of discipline in that real kind of confidence in the system in themselves that he's got and so you know, they remind me a lot of each other, different kind of personality-wise. Um, but, 
very similar in their approach and in the way they conduct business. Ladies and gentlemen, that okay. concludes the TCU Media Session. In approximately 25 minutes, George's Media Session will begin. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, look, you don't go through all the stuff we've gone through, uh, you know, the season and work as hard as these guys have worked and make all the sacrifices that these guys have made to say, hey, we're just happy to be here. You know what I mean? I think, if anything, it, it gives you extra motivation um, to, to finish the job. And, you know, because, you know, we haven't been here before. Um, and if you haven't been there before, then it's hard to, to say, well, we'll be back next year. You know what I mean? And so... It all gives, it just gives you extra motivation to go out and get it done, and it all begins with a belief and an attitude and a and a, and a desire to to make the most of your opportunity, and that's what this team's done all year, uh, and to focus on doing their job and and you know closing it out, whether it's ball games, whether it's um, you know closing out winning the Big 12 or regular season Big 12, playing the Big 12 championship, closing out the the semifinal game, whatever it is. This team has been able to close things out this year, and so we want to close out the season. And, and none of us will feel good about this year if we don't win this game. You know, I think that's, I think we'll feel like we squandered an opportunity, and, and you know, nobody wants to do that.